Scientific accuracy depends on quality data. At NIH, that means ensuring that genetic information used in research reflects the world's diversity. Neil Hanchard is a senior investigator and head of the Childhood Complex Disease Genomic Section at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Neil, welcome to the program. Thank you, it's nice to be here. So what exactly does diversifying genetic research mean? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so, you know, I think traditionally when we, we think about health and where we want to go in terms of the next frontier of health, you know, we want to ensure that we are able to provide the right medications for the right treatment for the right person. Um, and in order for that to be applicable to everyone, it's important that we involve everyone in the research that underpin underpins that. Um, and genetic research is very much at the core of, of that endeavor. And what's the current state of diversity in genetics research? Is it, is, are we at the point that, that we're there or? No, unfortunately we're not, we're not there. Um, I think traditionally genetics research has focused on a sort of subset of groups of people, at least from a genetic ancestry standpoint. And in fact, the recent estimates are that maybe 10, 20% of genetic, big genetic studies involve um, populations, say, outside of European ancestry. And give us an example of a particular disease that you might have uh, researched or studied. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think that we're, we're, we're learning more every day, so there's more and more stuff that's coming to it. I mean, I can think about research that has involved, um, say, childhood onset deafness. Um, deafness is uh, very genetic in origin, and the vast majority of sort of general um, birth deafness involves, um, say, two genes in populations of European or Asian ancestry. Um, but when you look in African ancestry individuals, those two genes only account for maybe 10 percent, maybe 5 percent. And so you can see that it's important for us to involve everyone if we want to have accurate diagnoses. So, so, but what does that tell you? Like, what, how, do you, how do you go from understanding that to helping kids yeah. that have deafness? Sure. So, uh, you know, as we learn more and more about the genes that are involved, we start to learn more about what it means to hear and the sort of mechanisms and molecular parts of how you hear. And that means that we're in a better place to um, create new treatments, to have new interventions, not just for people who, say, have congenital deafness or from a particular group, but for everyone, including people who have deafness when they're uh, getting older. And give us an idea of um, the LDL that you studied, right? This yeah. is the bad cholesterol. A lot of people in the United States have that issue. So what did you find out when you looked at the genetics behind it? Yeah, so, I mean, there's, there's the, the genetics of LDL and cholesterol has been known for many, many years. Um, and so it's, it's one of the things that um, people can test for now in, in terms of genetic sequencing. We can sequence the genes that are responsible for it and identify those uh, variants that might be causing a problem. Um, when we started to look at individuals who are of African ancestry and start to sequence through their genomes, we're finding that some of those genes, some of the variants in those genes are much more common than we thought. Um, and because having very, very, very high cholesterol is a relatively rare event, we expect that the variants that are going to cause that are going to similarly be rare. Um, and so one of the ways in which we decide whether or not a genetic variant is likely to be causing a problem or not is that we think about how common or rare it is. But rare is very relative to the reference that you're dealing with. And so if we don't have the full breadth of information, then we're not able to um, accurately uh, diagnose that. And do you also look at environmental factors? Because it could be, you know, differences in diet, differences sure. in air quality. Sure, and differences in diet um, and any number of environmental factors are always going to play a role. And it's in many ways how our genes or our bodies sort of interact with that. The, the hard part is that environment is pretty big. There are a lot of things that go into the concept of environment. And so being able to um, get a handle on that and the sort of data that you need to amass and the statistics that you need to do it with um, is a pretty daunting task. And so that's where we are now. We're trying to sort of integrate the two things to understand how your genes, how your body um, adapts to different environments. And tell us real quick about the, the mission of the National Human Genome Research Institute and how your work fits into that. 
Sure. Um, so as, especially as it re relates to genomics and genetics diversity, um, the Genome Institute has both um, sort of extramural programs or the programs that fund researchers from across the country, sometimes across the world, to be able to do genetic research. And a part of that is ensuring that those individuals are also mindful of having diversity among the, the people that they're studying. Um, but there's also an internal component to the, the Genome Institute, which is people like myself and, and others who have been on this program, um, where the focus is more on um, direct funding of the studies that we do and in many ways supporting studies that involve various populations around the world. So Neil, tell us a little bit about your background and your kind of career path and your journey. Yeah, it's a, it's a little convoluted. It's not the standard kind of path. Um, I grew up in Jamaica, that's where I did medical school. Um, I then did a PhD as a, as a Rhodes Scholar in uh, the UK. Um, and then I trained in pediatrics at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And then I did clinical genetics as a sort of training fellowship in Houston before coming to the NIH um, to set up my lab. And so I've tried to mix many of the sort of experiences and uh, research backgrounds that I've gotten through those experiences so that there's a, there's a little bit of pediatrics, there's a little bit of genetics, and we're trying to put it all together. And you know, we're talking about diversity in uh, research. There's also not a whole lot of diversity in research staff. So what do you do about that? Right. Uh, so that's that's certainly a problem, especially because uh, communities tend to want to engage with and be part participate in research that's run by researchers who come from their community. Um, and so there are a number of programs, both at the NIH and NHGRI level, but then also through a number of other organizations to try and ensure that, um, it, first of all, that we're educating people from all walks of life about genetics, um, inspiring them to participate in genetics, um, and ensuring that they have the resources and facilities to be able to do so. All right. Well, Neil, thanks so much for coming in and, and for your, your work on this. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and hit the subscribe button to be the first to watch our latest content. Full shows and more are available on our website at govmatters.tv.